Father in heaven, thank you for the great privilege to be able to um, sing about Jesus, to sing of his great work at the cross for us. Lord, we are mindful this morning of his empty tomb. We're even mindful of his ascension to your right hand. Lord, what a place that must be to gaze upon, to see you, the Father, and your Son in perfect unity, your will being done there in heaven perfectly without any resistance. What peace and what power and what love must be there. And Father, we are here, not there yet. But we know that we are pilgrims, we are aliens and strangers making our way there. And today is another important step in that journey. Lord, we do not know how many more steps each one of us has, but we pray that you would use our worship together as a church family to remind us that we are not alone. And we pray that you would use your word powerfully in us collectively. And Father, our prayer this morning is that you would put heavy, heavy accent on your son Jesus. May we see him as he truly is, the only, the one and only, the exclusive deliverer for the one who is in sin. How great you are, how great he is. Open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your word this morning, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 7 is where we need to head. This morning we are going to take a very large bite. Now we're going to take a lot of little bites. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. This is an elephant of a passage, and we're going to take a lot of bites. So let's do that. Romans chapter 7, verses 14 to 25 is where we will be this morning. And just a reminder, in this very important chapter, Paul has a, a particular special pastoral burden for Jews, uh, Jews who were once under the law with the hopes that it would be a power to them to achieve their own righteousness. They have now become believers in Jesus Christ. They are brothers, Paul says in chapter 7, verse 1, brothers in Christ, but he's speaking to the brothers who have an experiential knowledge of the law, who know law. They are brothers in Christ, and as all Jews were, they were born under the law of Moses, they were trained in the law of Moses, and then foolishly they decided to reject grace and live self-confidently under the law as a power to establish their own righteousness through their own works of the law. <laughs> and Paul was just once like them, wasn't he? And they all would have been, at one point, something like the Pharisee in Luke 18 who went to the temple to pray. Do you remember this in Luke 18? Here's what it says. Don't turn there. If you want to write it down, it's Luke 18, 9 to 12. Luke 18, verses 9 to 12. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God... I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. At one point, they would have loved what they were. They would have been proud of what they have made of themselves under that law, like that man was very proud of what he was. But something amazing happened. Jesus Christ was saving self-righteous Jews like that. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, quite apart from their works of the law. And then they would have been in a very confusing day. They knew the law was indeed something good given by God to the Jews to distinguish them as a nation, and they had developed strong, lifelong habits with the law, some good, most bad, 
And as they turn to their Old Testament, because remember in AD 56, there's no New Testament, Paul's writing it. As they turn to their Old Testament, nothing in the Old Testament was directing them away from the law. That makes sense, right? And then these Gentiles are believing in the same Messiah Jesus that they were, and those guys had no experience with law like the Jews who believed. And no apostle had ever been to the church in Rome yet to instruct them on just exactly what role, what role does the law play in the life of the believing Jew because of union with Christ now. And now finally, that instruction has come in this letter. It's coming from an apostle. Boy, and Paul recently dropped some bombs on the law, didn't he? Look back at Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Sin shall not be master over you. You are not under law. What? Well, shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. And then he said in chapter 7, verse 4, my brethren... My believing Jew brethren, you know about law. You also were made to die to the law. What? With the ultimate goal that you would bear fruit for God. Verse 5, while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law. Wait a minute, what? The law, what? What? Bear fruit for death? Verse 6, we've been released from the law? Those are some pretty staggering things to say. Really, Paul? I was born under the law. I was trained under the law. Yes, I misused it to try to establish my own righteousness, but you're saying I'm freed from it? Completely? I mean, there's not a blending here going on, mostly a life of grace with a little bit of law. You can see why Paul is burdened for these believing Jews who knew law. They can't be ignorant of this teaching. Verse 1, do you not know? You can't not know this. Paul is making his most convincing case that they as believing Jews are indeed freed entirely from the law. He's making his most convincing case that they can turn with complete gospel confidence away from the law in their Christian life and they can live a fruitful life for God without the law. What is Paul's most convincing argument? It is his own life. It is his own story when he was an unbelieving Jew under the reign of the law for the purpose of establishing his own righteousness before God. Paul is autobiographical beginning in verse 7 through the end of the chapter. Let's read that together, starting in verse 7. We've covered verses 7 to 13 last week. We're going to look at 14 to 25 today. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me, for sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good become death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, 
but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law, the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am literally slaving the law of God, slaving under the law of God. But on the other hand, with my flesh, I'm slaving under the law of sin. Paul believes that once he narrates his own past to them, that they will be convinced that living under the law for power is a dead end life. The the vivid account of his own unbelieving life under the law A life immersed in sin is enough, he believes, to show them that Jesus Christ is the only hope and deliverer for any man like this. And he's convinced that they will see turning to the law is deadly. In verses 7 to 13, Paul, in narrating his past, accomplished two really important things. First, he, he made it very clear that you cannot turn to the power of the law because sin has commandeered it. But at the same time, you cannot think poorly of the law. It is holy, righteous, and good. Why can they not turn to it as a power? Because sin commandeered the law and produced sin of every kind in Paul. The more unbelieving Paul turned to the law, the more sin was alive and he was dead. Even though the law is holy, righteous, and good, sin took that law and killed unbelieving Paul through that law. And now we reach verses 14 to 25, and Paul continues his autobiographical sketch. He continues to say, I. And with the word for in verse 14, for, Paul wants to explain what he meant in the prior verses about the sin power commandeering the commandment of the law to kill him when he was an unbeliever and it made sin become utterly sinful. The four explains the condition Paul was in as an unbeliever under the law in 7 to 13. Listen, the four does not introduce a new subject. It doesn't introduce a new man who is different from the man in verses 7 to 13. Verses 14 to 25 explains more of what Paul just said about his unbelieving life under the law. Grammatically speaking, that's what the four does. What potentially makes it confusing is what? Paul's change from the past tense to the present tense in verse 14. In verses 7 to 13, Paul utilized the past tense to describe his unbelieving life under the reign of the law with sin killing him through the law and sin being shown to be utterly sinful. 
In verses 14, 25, that is further explanation of that unbelieving life under the law, utilizing the present tense to do it. Now, just for a moment, think with me. What did Paul tell these Jewish believers they are freed from back in verse 4? Jewish believer, you are freed from the law through the death of Christ, right? Did he tell them that? Is Paul, as a believer, is he also freed from the law? Like he said his Jewish brothers were and are? Is that true for him? Then how could a presently freed from law life, that's Paul, further explain his former life under the reign of law when he wasn't free from law? If indeed this is the present for Paul. How? And if Paul does refer to his present life as a believer in verses 14 to 25, then what should we expect to see in this language? Well, we would expect to see language in it about being freed from the law, right? We would expect to see more talk about being united with Christ. And we would expect to see talk about being under grace and not being under law. We would see more mention of the Holy Spirit. We would see an optimism in the fight against sin like you see in chapter 6 and chapter 8. There's just one problem. What is it? None of that kind of language is present. In fact, just the opposite occurs in verses 14 to 25. This is one of the most, if not the most, law-centered, law-focused, law-committed, law-emphasizing descriptions of a man you'll find anywhere in Scripture. There is bondage to law, not freedom from the law in this section. There is death in this section, not hope and not life. And there is no ability to obey no matter how hard he internally wills to do what is right. What a contrast to Romans 6 verse 17. You became obedient to that form of teaching to which you were committed. You became obedient from the heart. Is that true for them, but it's not true for Paul? He said that was true for them, but if Paul is describing his presence, life in verses 14 to 25, it's not true for him because sin is a power he cannot resist. So again, verses 14 to 25 is further explanation of Paul's unbelieving life under the reign of the law with sin killing Paul through it and sin being shown to be utterly sinful. And Paul now says, let me explain that more to you now. For... Verse 14. And Paul uses the present tense to do just that. Are you troubled by that? Are you perplexed by that? Well, have you ever spoken of a past event or a past happening and used the present tense to do it? I bet you have, and you didn't even plan on doing it. You just did it. So I'm driving down the freeway, and I'm minding my own business. And all of a sudden, this guy pulls up right alongside me, and he is yelling at me. He's, he's rolling his window down, and, and now I'm getting really nervous. And he's waving, and he's screaming at me even louder now. Well, not now because I'm in here with you right now. I'm not back on the freeway. Look, that's, that's not an uncommon use of the present tense in language. It brings a past event into the present. It's like hitting rewind and then hitting play. It brings a past event into the present such that it makes the story and it makes the account more vivid to the hearers. It connects 
the hearers more securely to the narration, to the account. And this is Paul's point. This is his pastoral point. He's burdened for these people. He elaborates further on his unbelieving life under the law with sin, killing him through the law, showing sin to be utterly sinful. And he does it in a vivid way by speaking of that past condition in the present tense. He brings that past misery into the present. He sets it right in front of them so that he can make his pastoral point to his hearers in the most powerful and the most effective way he can. Why? Because when they see this playing out in front of their own eyes of what a life looked like under the law as an unbeliever, they'll be convinced to live their new life in Christ with gospel confidence that they indeed are freed from the law. They can live under the power of grace, chapter 6, and they can live by the power of the Holy Spirit, chapter 8, and they can be completely fruitful for God, Romans 7, 4 quite apart from the law. This is the vivid account of Paul's discoveries he made under the reign of the law when he was an unbeliever, and that is what this passage is all about. Here it is for you. You can see it. Unbelieving Paul makes three escalating discoveries under the rule of the law, under the reign of the law, which lead him to cry out for deliverance. Their escalating discovery is the one is, is important and it widens out into the second, which widens out into the third. Their significant escalating discoveries. Number one, unbelieving Paul discovers his slavery to sin overpowers his agreement with the law. In each of these three, there is the fact stated, the proof given for it, and then the conclusion. You'll see that in all three of these. The fact is stated in verse 14. Paul begins with what he and his fellow believing Jews all know, the law is spiritual. That's a further attempt by Paul to make sure that the law is seen in all of its virtue, in all of its virtue, despite the sin power's use of it for its own wicked ends. To say that it is spiritual means that it comes from the spirit and, and therefore it corresponds to the spirit. The law has a divine spiritual quality to it. It is linked to God, the spirit. And we know this, Paul says to the believing Jews. But Paul sees in himself an utter contrast to that spiritual law, verse 14. But I am of flesh. Flesh is human weakness. An inability in contrast to God. God is not weak. God does not have any inabilities, but only able power. And then the context gets to determine if something sinful is meant by this flesh. And obviously here, that is the case. So flesh is human weakness and inability in contrast to God, but here it is sinful human weakness and sinful inability in contrast to the spiritual law. As one, as unbelieving Paul says, who is sinfully weak and unable, he is what? Verse 14. He is sold into bondage to the sin power. And again, the definite article is there in the original, and he's personifying sin as if it is a power. I'm sold into bondage into the, to the sin power. It's a passive verb which means that Paul is carried off to the sin power. He is sold as property to the sin power. The sin power owns him. The sin power possesses him. The sin power controls him. Unbelieving Paul, as one who is of the flesh, he is not his own man. He's the property of the sin power in him. That sin power dwells in him, verse 17. It dwells in him, verse 20. So the fact stated at the beginning is that the fleshy, sinful weakness and sinful inability is in contrast to spiritual law and that fleshy, sinful weakness of his and inability is completely unable to resist or thwart being sold into bondage to sin. That's the fact unbelieving Paul has discovered. The proof of it, verses 15 and 16. Here is the proof that I am in my sinful flesh, 
uh, and weakness and inability that I'm in bondage to the sin power. For, you see, that explains what's right in front of it. That's how the word for works oftentimes. What I am doing, I do not understand. I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. What kind of language is that? That is the language of a slave who has come to realize he is a slave. And that it doesn't matter what he wants. The master gets what the master is after. And that is a puzzling discovery for an unbelieving Jew who only brought the spiritual law near him to empower him to do good. I don't understand. Things are not going as I thought they would go. Notice that it doesn't matter what unbelieving Paul inwardly likes, verse 15, or what he inwardly hates. It has absolutely no bearing on, it has no powerful effect on his actual practice. This fleshy, sinfully weak and unable man, if, if he likes the idea of some practice, he is powerless to perform it. I am not practicing what I like. Does he say he's practicing some of it, but just not all of it? No, I am not practicing the good that I want. If he hates the idea of some practice, he is powerless to stop himself from doing it. I am doing the very thing I hate. Do you know what that is? That's slavery. That's slavery. There's no other way to see that. This is the proof of his statement in verse 14 that he is sinfully weak and unable as a slave to resist the sin power within the spiritual law can inform his conscience. It can point to what he should like, and the spiritual law can point to what he should hate, but it makes no difference in his actual practice because he is the slave of sin. He is owned by the sin power he is the property of the sin power. Verse 16, Paul as an unbeliever says, if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, and by the way, there's no doubt that that is indeed the case. He says, I agree with the law. That mean, meaning, I acknowledge the law's right. It's possible to be a Jewish unbeliever, to know the law is spiritual, and to even agree with what it says is good, and that is unbelieving Paul. But as a slave of the sin power within him, none of that interest in the law, none of his fleshy, sinfully weak efforts to want what the law says actually works itself out in practice. He has no ability within him to actually achieve what the law says no matter how much he tries to align himself with the law or agree with the law. The spiritual law came with no power to enable him to do the good that he likes or to stop what he hates. What's the conclusion he draws? Verse 17, he says, so now, what does the slave of the sin power conclude? Something really interesting. He says, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. Something very important is happening in him as an unbeliever. This is an expression that he doesn't feel unified within. But he is now at odds somewhat with what is going on in him as an unbeliever. Think back on that proud, self-righteous, self-confident Pharisee in Luke 18. You remember him? That man did not feel within any discord, any disagreement about what he was, about what he was doing. He only affirmed himself. He certainly could see no sin power dominating him within. And that kind of self-righteous, self-confident unbeliever sees no reason to change his course. As long as 
that kind of an unbeliever stays in that condition, he will not turn to a savior. But unbelieving Paul here in verses 14 to 17 doesn't sound like that guy any longer. He sees now with more clarity a sin power within him that thwarts his attempts at what is good. His way of explaining what he doesn't understand is verse 17. No longer am I the one doing it, but sin dwells in me. That's who's doing it. His way of explaining what he doesn't understand is that. There, there's a conflict within him, for sure. This is his best way to grasp what it is. He's trying to align himself with spiritual good law, and none of his efforts to do that generate the right practice. What is his explanation of what he doesn't understand? The sin which dwells in me is doing this. And I can't resist it. It owns me. Listen, this is not a description of the mixed condition of a believer that we love and cling to. Of a believer fighting against sin by the power of grace and by the power of the indwelling spirit. Listen, what is this? This is a conflicted unbeliever whose conscience is indeed informed by the law, but who is not in the right condition to be able to carry out what the good law says. And he is discovering this. His slavery to sin overpowers his agreement with the law. I need to ask you this morning, are you an unbeliever? If you are, do you know what kind of an unbeliever you are? Do you look more like a self-confident, self-righteous unbeliever in Luke 18 who sees no conflict within? You're very proud of what you're accomplishing. In total approval of what you see inside. Or are you reflecting something like what unbelieving Paul is here? Trying to agree with what is good and right but completely unable to act on it. Listen, that's an important self-discovery to make, but you need more than that. You shouldn't be either one of those guys, but you have to become the one if you're ever gonna see your need for a savior. And that leads to unbelieving Paul's second discovery. The first discovery must lead to the second. Here it is. Unbelieving Paul, number two, discovers everything he wants is completely thwarted by indwelling sin. Everything he wants is completely thwarted by indwelling sin. And again, you see the fact, the proof, and the conclusion. Verses 18 to 20, it's an expansion on what he just said in verses 14 to 17. And he begins with the fact in verse 18. I, now, just let him say what he's saying. What does he know? I know what? Nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Listen, that is quite an important discovery to make about himself. Unbelieving Paul is gaining insight. The, the good that the law is characterized by, that the law points to, that good does not live in him. It does not dwell in him. For, he says, I am of that sinfully weak and unable flesh. And in that sinfully weak and unable flesh condition, good that the law is characterized by and even points to, it's not found in him. Now Paul's going to prove that fact that he states. Verse, middle point of verse 18, he explains, for... The willing to do that good, the willing is present, but the doing of the good is not present. That statement is, is a statement of complete and utter thwarting of the good that he wants to do. It doesn't matter if what Paul wants or wills to do is good, he, he's unable to accomplish it 
He's powerless. He's weak. He's incapable. The willing to do good is present, but the doing of the good is not present. He continues, verse 19. The good that I want, what does he say? What does he say? I do not do. Answer this, uh, but he says, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Answer this question. In that statement, the good that I want, I do not do. How much good does Paul say he does? I don't do good. That's what he says. None. That is an explanation and proof that nothing good dwells in me. If nothing good dwells in me, I don't do any good that I want to do. No matter how aligned with law I make myself. Answer this question. What does Paul practice in verse 19? What does he say? The very evil he doesn't want. Again, what does this say about Paul's willpower? As an unbeliever, if he wills what is good, he isn't able to perform it. If he wills to not do good, or to not do evil, excuse me, he's powerless to stop himself from doing that very evil. Listen, let's be honest with the language here. Note very carefully what Paul says and how he says it. Note what he is not saying. Listen, this is what he is not saying. He is not lamenting how he wants to do good but just can't do the good perfectly. I just can't do it the way good truly ought to be done. That's not what he says. He just says bluntly and honestly what? I do not do the good. And I practice the very evil. Do you know what class of person that puts Paul in? Here's Romans 1, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, and evil. Filled with all evil. Puts him in that class. Do you know what class that puts him in? Chapter 3, verse 12. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does what? Good. Not even one. Not even the unbelieving Jew who has brought a spiritual law close to him to empower him to try to do the good. Not even that guy. This is the proof that nothing, nothing good dwells in me. I, I will to do it. I see what the law says. I'm completely thwarted in the attempt to do it. Powerless. What's the conclusion? Verse 20. It's very similar to what he said in verse 17. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, and again, there's no doubt that that indeed is what is going on in him. He says, I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin power which dwells in me is doing it. Again, this reflects that he's aware of discord in him. Now think carefully on what he says in this paragraph. What does not dwell in him? In verse 18. There's no good. That doesn't, good does not dwell in him. It's nowhere to be found in him. In verse 20 here, what does he say does dwell in him? The sin power, sin personified as a power, that lives in me. No good in me living, sin power living in me. In that condition, if he tries to use a spiritual good law and he wills for something that is good that that law points to because he's informed his conscience by it, he can't do it. And the explanation for that is it's the sin power in me. The sin power that dwells in him, that lives in him. This is a statement not of trying to escape responsibility. 
This is the statement of his awareness as an unbeliever that he is not his own man. He is not on the throne of his life. The sin power is, and he must go along with it even if he does not want to. He's a slave. No matter how much he might try to oppose the sin power living in him, he's forced to go along with it. He is powerless to resist. Let me ask you, when is a master's power most on display? When the slave agrees with what the master wants? Or when the slave disagrees and even protests but must go along helplessly anyway? Unbelieving Paul is making escalating discoveries. He he expresses that, that it is no longer his intent to sin. He wants to do the good that the law points to, but the sin power mastering him and living in him is irresistible in the end, and he must sin. Paul brings that unbelieving past with the law and sin and his sinful flesh. He brings it into the present so his Jewish readers can vividly see playing out right in front of their eyes the discoveries he is making under the law. What Paul has just said in verses 14 to 20, this confirms, again, Romans 3, 12, there is no one who does good, not even one, not even the Jew, unbelieving Jew armed with a good law. Listen, this is why you must put, as an unbeliever, if you are an unbeliever today, you must put no confidence in your flesh that is sinfully weak, and you must put no confidence in even a good law from God in your condition, because both are powerless to do anything about indwelling sin in you. Paul Paul is, is trying to empower himself, and he is unable to. Your flesh is powerless because it is sinful. God's laws are powerless too, not because they're sinful though. Just the opposite is true. It's spiritual. It's good. But God's spiritual law was never designed by God to be an empowerment that the sinner would use to stop sinning or to start doing good. No matter how much you might as an unbeliever try to agree with God about what's good, As an unbeliever, you will be completely thwarted in doing what the law says every time because of your indwelling sin. Listen, for a while, you may be very um, self-deceived and you may be very impressed and very self-affirming with your achievements that you've been able to make with, with religious rules like the unbeliever in Luke 18. But if you don't come to this discovery that Paul has made, You have no hope of being saved. Have you come to this discovery yet as an unbeliever? But there is still another even more significant discovery to make. Here's the progression that's going on. First, unbelieving Paul discovers his slavery to sin overpowers his agreement with the law. And then that widens and becomes more significant to, and it leads to the discovery that everything he wants is completely thwarted by indwelling sin. And that leads unbelieving Paul to discover an important conclusion about his life under the power of the law. Lastly, this morning, unbelieving Paul discovers life under the law makes him wretched and in need of deliverance. Life under the law makes him wretched and in need of deliverance. Again, you see the fact, the proof, and the conclusion. The fact is stated in verse 21. What is unbelieving Paul discovering as a result? He says, I I find. That means he's discovered something through his investigation inwardly, an inward investigation. Paul does not say, I've got a hunch of what's going on here. He doesn't say, I've got a guess on what's going on here. He's not saying, I'm going to posit a theory. He says, no, I've discovered this through investigation in my life. What is he finding? The principle. Do you see that in verse 21? I find then the principle. That literally means the law. I find the law. Paul means he has discovered at this point a directive, a mandate, a regulation, a principle that controls him. What is it? 
This is the controlling feature of his life. He tells us in verse 21 that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Now, that sounds funny, strange to our ears. Here's what it means. Evil is ever ready at hand, even though Paul may want to do something good from the law. That's what he just stated in all verses 14 to 20. It doesn't matter what Paul wills. It doesn't matter what Paul wants. Evil is not restrained in him, but instead it's raised up in the blocks waiting to be triggered to go. And every single time when the trigger's pulled, evil goes. And that has proven to be a conflict within him that unbelieving Paul fails in every time. Paul's not winning in verses 14 to 20. And he's not winning in 21 to 25. And that conflict that he has resulting in his failure, that's the controlling feature of his life. I, I want to do good, but evil just jumps at it every time. That's what marks me. That's what is the controlling feature of my life. Now, here's the proof of that. Verse 22. For... I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. Boy, that's a strong way to put it, isn't it? That's the strongest term yet. Unbelieving Paul states how much he inwardly affirms and is trying to align his will with God's law. He joyfully confirms, uh, concurs with it. By the way, do you know Paul has already said stuff like this in Romans? Go back to chapter 2, verse 17. Watch this. This is not anything new. Remember, he's taking the unbelieving Jew to task here in chapter 2, verse 17. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon law and boast in God and you know his will, is it possible for an unbelieving Jew to know God's will? He says it is. And you know his will and approve the things that are essential. Well, how did he approve the things that are essential? Verse 18, being instructed out of the law. So an unbelieving Jew can be instructed by the law, know what is essential, approve of it, and rely on it. And not be saved. And all Paul is doing here is expressing the same thing. I joyfully concur with this. I approve of what is essential. I've been instructed out of the law. And Paul says that strong affirmation of the law of God, it occurs somewhere. Where does it occur? Look at verse 22. In the inner man. Contextually, what does that mean? Ask yourself this. Don't go to another passage to try to define inner man. Just stay right here. Has Paul talked about anything going on inwardly as opposed to what's going on outwardly? Yes, it's all he's been talking about. What he is aiming for inwardly with his own will is one thing, and what is actually working itself out is quite another thing. It's the opposite Inner man, as a phrase, is not a technical term reserved only for the new creation in Christ. That's the new man. That's a technical term reserved only for the one who's in Christ, united with Christ. But inner man in this context simply acknowledges that unbelieving Paul had an inward target in one direction, but what worked itself outward from there was a completely other target in the opposite direction. Unbelieving Paul, like all unbelievers, has discovered he has an inner man. So the reason he wants to do good is because... He joyfully concurs with the law of God in the inner man. He's informed his conscience. He is under the law of God with hopes, with the plan that it will empower him to do good. But, verse 21, evil is ever ready at hand to act. And that is then what he confirms in verse 23. But, verse 23, I see a different law in the members of my body. Second, mention of law. There's the law of God, and there's the 
law of my members. Unbelieving Paul labors to affirm in the strongest way the law of God within, but as he moves outward to his members, to his actions, there's another law there in the members. And both of those two laws are under the controlling law principle of his life that he's losing. Well, how do these two laws interact? The law of God on the inner man and the law on his members. Well, look what it says in verse 23. I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind. Another law mentioned. Waging war. And note what else is said. And, that's not all it's doing, how'd the war go? Making me, Paul says, making me a prisoner. So Paul himself has become a prisoner of war. There is a war of laws within him, and he lost. He lost. He's a prisoner to whom? To what, verse 23, making me a prisoner of the law of the sin power, which is in my members. Now we have a fourth law mentioned. There is a proliferation of law going on in this man. Making him a prisoner. That's the same thing he said back in verse 14. I was sold into bondage to sin. I've been made a prisoner of the law of the sin power which is in my members. What is Paul doing? There's a controlling law feature over my life. There's the law of God in the inner man. There's the law of my mind. There's the law in my members. And there's the law of sin in my members. What is he doing with all this law, 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 law speak? In this description, this is what he was as an unbelieving Jew. Remember, he's bringing his past into the present for vividness, for greater engagement. What is he? He is a man under law as a power. His choice is to reject grace and instead turn to the law to empower himself to try to do good. And so we shouldn't be surprised to discover with Paul that law is everywhere in him. It's everywhere. There's a controlling mandate of his mind. There's a controlling mandate of his members. There's God's controlling mandate in his inner man. There's the controlling mandate of the sin power in his members. Where is the reign of grace in this man? That he mentioned in Romans 6 for all believers. Nowhere. It's just law. Where is union with Christ that frees a man from law? It's not mentioned. It's just union with law. Where's the newness of the spirit he mentioned in verse 6? Nowhere. It's just flesh and sin and Paul and law. Listen, Paul is surrounded by law. He is dominated by law. There is a proliferation of law within him. And which laws are winning and which laws are losing? And what does it mean for Paul? Is Paul a better man for having turned to the law? Which laws are winning? The law in his members and the law of the sin power have totally defeated what other laws? The law of his mind and even God's law in his inner man. Listen very carefully. When you put the good law of God in partnership with an unbelieving man's law of his mind, there is no other outcome to expect except what? Defeat. That's what he says. And the law of sin has carried unbelieving Paul off as a captive from war. And this is the proof that Paul may will to do good, informed by the law, affirming the law, but evil is ever ready in the blocks just to go, just pull the trigger. Boom. And it does so. You can't find a more law-centered, law-focused, law-committed, law-emphasizing way to describe a man than this. There is no peace within this man. There is only conflict. And again, a conflict that Paul is not winning. 
That's the controlling mandate that he has discovered in his life in verse 21. What's the conclusion, verse 24 and 25? Paul, what's it like to be this kind of man who's not freed from the law? Unbelieving Paul at this point has reached a place that the self-confident, self-righteous, and self-approving Pharisee in Luke 18 did not reach. That unbelieving man was only very affirming of what he thought he was, but unbelieving Paul in Romans 7, however, is crying out in despair because of the kind of man he now has discovered himself to be. He turned within to his flesh power. He turned to the law within, and now he is in big trouble, and he needs rescuing, and he knows it. Verse 24, wretched man that I am, miserable man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death. Remember, Paul said this about his unbelieving life back in verse 10. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died, and this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. That's what he just explained, did he not? In his body, a battle of laws is waged and he is taken captive by sin, and sin kills its prisoner of war. Well, then what's happening in verse 25? What's happening at the first part of verse 25? Paul interrupts his own narration. He pushes pause on the video that is running. And he can't help but inject the glorious answer in the form of a parenthesis. It's God. It's Jesus. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's painful for Paul who's narrating this. It's painful for Paul the apostle to tell this story without injecting something of the singular hope that Jesus Christ is for such a man as the one he's describing. But then he steps back out and he pushes play and he lets the vivid but depressing account finish. That's the end of verse 25. The account ends again on the note of the conflict within between laws and it ends on the note of slavery. In verse 25, the last half there, both statements that are made are actually slave statements in regards to the law mentioned. Look what he says halfway through verse 25. On the one hand, he says, I myself. Don't, make any, don't, don't think anybody else is involved in this. This is me. I myself. On the one hand, I myself, with my mind, I am slaving. That's the term. I am slaving under the law of God. Do you know what that is? That's the other way of describing Romans 7.1. Look at Romans 7, 1 again. The law rules over a man, reigns over a man as long as he lives. That's the, that's the testimony from the master's side. What's the testimony from the slave's side? I'm slaving under the law of God as long as I'm alive until a death comes. Paul, a slave, confirms that, verse 1, with his own testimony. He is slaving under the power of a good law and a spiritual law, the law of God. He is not freed from the law yet through union with Christ in his death. But at the same time, interestingly, chapter 7, verse 25, on the other hand, I myself, make no mistake about this, it's me and only me, I am slaving with my flesh the law of sin. And that is a Sad case for the unbeliever who rejects grace in salvation and instead for a merit based approach through law. That one who does that might think initially, all I'm doing is I'm picking up one law. That's all I'm doing. I'm just picking up one set of rules, the law of God, and I'm working hard in my own strength to achieve righteousness. But what that one must discover, if he's ever going to turn away from himself to Christ, is that he cannot slave away under just the law of God without also at the same time slaving under the law of sin. Sin. 
You can't pick up just the law of God and expect that's all I'm going to slave under. And it'll, and I'll win because at the same time, all he's been saying in chapter seven is the law of sin is there also and it wins. This does not end on a good note. What a chapter. Paul's making his most convincing case that these Jewish believers who had experiential knowledge of a law and how it works, he's making his most convincing case that they indeed are freed. They must be freed entirely from the law. And they can't turn, and, and sorry, and they can turn now with complete gospel confidence away from the law in their Christian life, and they can live a fruitful life for God, verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 4 of this chapter. And what is Paul's most convincing argument? It's his own story. When he was an unbelieving Jew under the reign of law for the purpose of establishing his own righteousness before God. He believes that once he narrates his own past to them, they'll be convinced that living under the law for power is a dead end life. His retelling of his own unbelieving life under the law, immersed in sin, it should be enough to show them that Jesus Christ is the only hope and deliverer for a man like the one he's describing. And they should conclude that if one turns to the law within, it's deadly. He brings that past misery of his unbelieving life and he brings it into the present so that he can make his pastoral point to his hearers in the most powerful way, effective way, vivid way he can. Why? When they see his former life under the law, what it looked like as an unbeliever, they'll be convinced to live their new life in Christ with gospel confidence that they are indeed free from the law. They can live under the power of grace. They must live under the power of grace. They can live by the power of the Holy Spirit. They must live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they will be completely fruitful for God apart from the law. Chapter 7, verse 4. This is the vivid account of Paul's discoveries he made under the reign of the law when he was an unbeliever. Now, some of you may feel this morning like you just had something taken away from you, something significant and descriptive of your own sanctification process if this is truly what Paul is saying. But can I assure you of something? Can I assure you that what Paul says here about an unbeliever's life under the reign of law and sin and death, that does not take anything away from the reigning power of grace. It only affirms it. You have not lost from this passage union with Christ. Rather, this passage necessitates union with Christ. If Paul means what Paul says about an unbeliever here is true, it doesn't take away from the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. It actually prepares you for it in Romans 8. It does not take away from the work of the Father to finish the good work he began in you. It just actually shows you where he's going to work and where he's not going to work to do that. This does not take away from the role of faith in sanctification or the role of prayer in sanctification. It only shows how much more you need them. And it doesn't take anything away from the genuine, intense struggle the true believer has within against indwelling sin. It doesn't take anything away from that. It provides for us, it provides for our hopeful struggle against sin. It provides a helpless contrast to it. You still have this morning grace 
you still have union with Christ. You still have the Holy Spirit dwelling within, believer. You still have the faithful work of the Father. You still need faith in your sanctification process. You still need prayer. And you still have the genuine, intense, but hopeful struggle, hopeful struggle against indwelling sin. We just need to find a better text that describes the inward struggle. Let's pray. And I'm just going to close us tonight, or it feels like tonight. You feel like you've been sitting here all day too, like me. I'm just going to close us in prayer, and then we can dismiss ourselves in a moment. Why don't you just take a moment and, and pray. And ask God just to quiet your heart and just express back to him for a moment what is on your heart and your mind. Father in heaven, what we know is that when you save an unbeliever, you prepare them to see their need for a savior. Perhaps there is no greater passage in our Bible to show us that than this one. With vividness and clarity, a man's life is set before us. And Father, all I can think is how I, how we must rejoice that you know how to bring a man to his knees as an unbeliever so that he will stop looking within and he will only look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, may it be the case this morning that there's even one here ready to do that. Open their eyes, let them see. Let, this, let them see the, the utter bankruptness within and let them see the richness and the power of Jesus Christ without. Stir up within them a desire to cast themselves upon you, upon Jesus, to be saved by faith alone, quite apart from works. Give them gospel confidence that they can live a life pleasing to you in the gospel. Lord, that's what we have discovered. That's what we must rediscover every day. And I pray that we would do that even today again. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.